Thank you very much, Harold, for a nice introduction, but mostly for the nice invitation. It's a very a, much a pleasure for me. First time in Bochum. Um, I've been around and living in Saxony already for eight years in Czech Republic right now. I never was in Bochum, so I'm very happy to be here. Yesterday we had a wonderful excursion with Harold to this industrial area, very interesting ecological setting, so you have there a lot of, I would say, m material you know, for to develop nice research ideas. And um, as uh, he was explaining, my idea today was to illustrate resilience in two different ways. For that, I brought two examples from my uh, home region. I'm from southern Patagonia. And uh, I would like to, let's say, to pinpoint the differences, I mean, the different approaches you can use to understand resilience when you are looking at development in a short and in a long term. And uh, also there is, um, uh, this uh, picture is from my hometown, Punta Arenas, it's from 40s, no? Uh, but also would like to maybe discuss this uh, sometimes mechanical idea we have, not just about resilience, but about society sometimes, very much like problems. So the car has got a problem, it's got stagnated there, and we have to find a way to take it out, you know, to get back to the road or to get back to the track, you know. But uh, sometimes uh, the complexity we are facing is a lot much more higher, so we need really sometimes to step back to a more conceptualization, a more conceptual approach to really define how we understand the things prior to jump into addressing specific solutions. Einstein, he got a wonderful statement on that. He said, if I could have to solve uh, a problem, I would spend 95% uh, of the time thinking about what kind of problem is that and just 5% of the time I would give to design the specific solution. So, And uh, for that purpose, uh, the, the presentation is divided in those four parts. Uh, first, some concepts about resilience, basically definitions, challenges and limitations, and also the approach you will find in the presentation, then the two study cases. Um, as I said, the part one, long term, looking at the socio-ecological system of uh, southern Patagonia. Um, it's more um, generic approach, uh, larger scale, regional scale. And the second one is uh, short term with a specific threat. I'm going to present, introduce to you a, a heat vulnerability index we develop for the city of Santiago de Chile. And then hopefully, to have some discussion, but of course, uh, um, I would like to invite you to interrupt me or to make questions any time you need or any time you want to go uh, in to discuss something I present. I would like to have really much more a talk than a formal no, presentation. Um, so, as you read the, in the abstract, the, the rationale behind is that first, urban systems are highly adaptive from one side, and at the same time they have a high capacity to recover. No, maybe that is a kind of uh, signature urban ecosystems they have, they make them different from other ecosystems you can compare. No? So the capacity to recover is, uh, is much more higher. Resilience um, as a concept originated in the natural sciences, it's still needing to incorporate you know, um, dimensions which are out of the basically environmental one. And also there is a need to develop spatial explicit approaches. So what that means is that in the very conceptualization of the problem we are analyzing, the space has to be a fundamental part since the beginning, no, not just a pro producing a map after with the result, no, but in the very conception of the research, the space is implicit there. And this is because when you are considering the 
spatial dimension of the society, you are actually assuming that there is an inosotropy. What it means, that it means that is the socioeconomic dimension is not homogeneous, it's not a isotropic plane, but has got a specific texture, a specific distribution in the space. No? So that has to be well reflected you know, with the um, research method and the operationalization as well. So resilience has become a very important topic during the last year, basically for those two issues I put there. No? First one is climate change. You know? So cities are very much worried about changes in the weather, changes in the climate, you know? so they have to really develop mechanisms to adapt. The second example in the second and the third part is going to talk about that specifically, but also for uh, this process of planetary urbanization. And just here, uh, explanation why I put this image is because I'm not talking about the demographic dimension, which is absolutely already overcome. I mean, everybody's talking about the threshold of 50% of population, etc. This is an arbitrary urbanization. I'm talking about a much more powerful process, which is the physical dimension of urbanization, as you can see in that image. So cities, they have a physical expression, which is expanding a very fast pace. Just to give you two numbers, cities in Switzerland are expanding at a rate of one square meter per minute. So one square meter is being sealed every single minute. In Switzerland, a country with uh, a stagnation in terms of population, no population growth. If you want the figure for Latin America, it's so 40 square meters per minute as an average for the South American continent every single minute. So that is the dimension of, the, of urbanization I like to talk. The other one from demography is an arbitrary assumption. I think that we have been urban since the urban revolution Schilder talked about. No, we started with the Neolithic. No? So some definitions of resilience. No? The first one, of course, from Hollings, no, is the ability to persist, to continue, functioning when change, but not necessarily to remain the same. There's another definition connected, which is the capacity to absorb disturbance, reorganize while undergoing the change, but still retaining the same uh, core functions, a structure, the identity, and the feedbacks. Now, this is, of course, a, a, a conceptualization in terms of ecosystem resilience, no? Then, there are many more definitions of resilience. There is a kind of inconsistency between them. There is no general agreement on any definition of resilience. And there are also some conceptual tensions no, within those definitions. And that's why in the approach I brought today, no, to let's say to have a much more open discussion, I'm going to concentrate in that specific approach. No, it's that first, as I said, um, I don't know what happened. Um, general resilience, no, is the first example. It's a long term adaptability of this socioecological system of Punta Arenas in Patagonia at larger scale. And then in the second example, is a specified resilience uh, to a known threat in a short-term response, and uh, a smaller, also, a scale, a city scale. No? So let's um, go to the, let's say, geographical setting. This is the, the last part of the South American continent. No? So I can add here some, some specific geographic uh, uh, milestones. You have uh, the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean. This is the Strait of Magellan. This is the the city of Punta Arenas is the, we say, the capital of Patagonia. It's the largest city there since the middle of 19th century. Here you have Cape Horn, and these are the large ice fields, a very large uh, reservoir of uh, fresh water. And also you can distinguish in the image already that um, the, this part, well, the line, is the division between Argentina here and Chile here. And then you can see that there is a very high contrast 
between the two sides. One side is much more flat, drier. This, fl this side is much more fragmented and much more wet as well. So that produces a very strong eco ecosystem gradient. So they really, the changes are dramatically and they take place in a very short distance. So for instance, when you move from this blue point here, uh, well, it's a little bit north, uh, let's say, and to Punta Arenas, you have more or less 100 kilometers, and then you go from uh, around 2,000 milliliters of precipitation here to 500 milliliters precipitation here. So I'm saying that the gradient is very, very strong. And that, of course, has, let's say, uh, that though some way produce uh, very specific ways of exploitation of this uh, territory. So here you have uh, the land uh, use land cover map, and then you see the, um, in certain specific classes how these changes, they have this east-west gradient. You have ecosystem uh, of steeps here, then you have forest ecosystem here, and then you have uh, the wetlands and um, pit peatlands actually here in this uh, part which is geographically very similar to Norway, fire, channels, glaciers, etc. So just with a set of pictures to illustrate you how these uh, envir different environments they look like. So here you have a, a part of this, those mountains and fires and channels to the Pacific side. Uh, here is an installation of uh, uh, aquaculture. This is more or less how it looks like that. The, um, this um, territory, I like to say, I don't like to use too much the word uh, landscape uh, <laughs> for certain reasons, Harold and I remember very well. <laughs> no? um, all those places are very far away. Um, maybe we can turn uh, the light a little bit off, no, to see whether the pictures maybe. No, okay. So you have to sail for those places I'm showing now. You have to sail um, four days more or less to get there. No, so it's a very far away uh, place. Uh, thank you. Hello. So this is how. It, thank you, Harold, very much. This is how it looks like normally. You know, it's very abrupt uh, orography. Then the, the channels, uh, mountains, you know, everywhere, and the climatic conditions. They are very dynamic and they are changing across the day. We say normally that we have four seasons in one day. You know, so you can have really summer, winter, uh, autumn in just one day. You know? um, so all, all those pictures are from... Uh, this Pacific uh, side, we have, of course, very beautiful glaciers there, no? Um, this is a famous Perito Moreno glacier, which goes to the Argentine side, no? It's very close to a town uh, named uh, El Calafate. Um, we have a mostly Notophagus uh, forest formation there, Notophagus pumilio, Notophagus betuloides, no? Um, uh, very wet environments in, in this area already precipitation uh, uh, rises up to 5,000 milliliters per year. No? Um, so the forest normally gets very much to the to the very coastline there. You know? It is also called evergreen you know? because it doesn't lose the, the, the leaf during the winter. No? So the leaves they remain, they just change the color but they remain in the tree, there is no loss of leaves. No. Um, this is um, Cape Froward. This is the last part of the, con of the South American continent when the S South America very finished. There. This is the, it's this part. No, it's so you, you can see there, up there, there is a cross. No. It was there built up when the Pope came for a visit in 90s and it is a uh, kind of um, because he, he was involved when we were about to get into a war with Argentina in the 80s with 
with two dictators actually, and then the Pope got involved, and then we, we get an agreement for not going to war, so then we build this cross there as a sign of uh, friendship between the two countries. So then when you start to move more to the, um, to the Atlantic side, you know, then the towns, they started to, to appear. This is the last town in the world, that's this Puerto Williams. There is no any settlement closer to Antarctica than this one. It's a very small town, 2,000 inhabitants. This is the famous uh, national park, Torres del Paine. Mm. It's um, also um, a biosphere protect area. Here is again Torres del Paine. Here you can see the towers. That's why it's called Torres. Torres is towers. No, they have f very, very high geological formations. And here you have already the steep ecosystem. So you see that the contrast you know, it is, is very, very much dramatic. And this is how it looks like the uh, ecosystem, the steep ecosystem normally. You know, with guanacos, is typical animal there you know, in the steep. And this is already in the in Punta Arenas, looking to north, no, this is how it looks, it's very flat, it's a glacier fluvial no, a territory, no, um, covered by grasslands. And then here is already reaching to the Atlantic side, so here you can see the Cordillera de los Andes, the mountains already, looking to the Pacific, and all this huge um, flat extension. Patagonia actually, as a geographical unit, has got 700,000 square kilometers. This is more or less two times Germany. You know, as a whole, it's a geographical unit, and it's shared by the two countries. Mm. Uh, then we have, uh, of course, uh, uh, economic activities. Uh, here's uh, exploitation of forest there. Uh, this is um, remain. These are remains of uh, mining. Copper mining was abandoned in the 70s. This is also a place. It's a more or less five days of sailing, I would say, to reach that place. Now it's completely abandoned. Mm. Um, main um, activity in the beginning, as I'm going through that, is animal husbandry. So we have um, this, let's say, um, exploitation of grasslands there. Uh, fishery as well, and of course biodiversity. You now we have uh, really a very beautiful assemblage of waterfall there in Patagonia. No birds and this kingfisher, but we have many others, including some endangered species there in the surroundings of the city. This wetland specific one, and then the city of Punta Arenas, which is something special about this very city, is that is the only one looking to the east. All the cities in the country, they are looking uh, to the ocean, which is to the west. No? So then you see the sunrise, mountains, and the sunset is going to the, to the ocean. But in Punta Arenas, it's upside down. This is the sunrise. No, it's six in the morning, this picture. So it's the only place in the country where you see the sunrise no, going, rising up from the ocean. It's a very special place. So, of course, the skies, they are, uh, you know, through the year, for this specific condition of very, very high latitude, is, uh, they are burning, we say, you know, the sky burning. So, there were four etnias, I just brought uh, pictures of two uh, aborigines living there. First, there are the Tewelches, or Aohonigeng, the meaning is uh, fires people, the Welches is the denomination the other Indians from the north they gave to them. And those were the people, um, the first Europeans they saw them walking, you know, like wandering you know, on, the, on the coastline, uh, wearing those um, sp special, let's say, with, uh, I don't know what the name is, like a special clothes, let's say, made from animals, from guanaco. And they are also very tall. So when the crew saw them, they remind the myth of the Patagon from the Greeks. And that's why they, say they, they also they look at the footprint. If you see the foot, they have you know, also covered by this um, animal skin. So they were leaving very huge footprints. And then they called them Patagons, and that's the, from where the name Patagonia come from, you know, from those Indians. And then uh, we have the others in the island, in Tierra del Fuego Island, the Selknam, 
or onas, as they were called, no? And they were completely killed uh, already by the beginning of 20th century because of the exploitation of animal husbandry. Those Indians, they were hunting the sheep, and then the owners of those sheep, they were killing the Indians because they were you know, hunting them. They thought they were for, for to be eaten. No? <laughs> they never understood the concept of private property. Um, and then I, I'm, I'm going through the economic development of the region like a history, like, like going through a time. No? So the first attempt of uh, peopling the Patagonia region, it was in the 16th century. In that time, Spain and England, they were in a very strong fight you know, for to have more territories, and there were many pirates going there. So it was a captain who convinced the king in Spain to settle uh, people in the Strait of Magellan if they wanted to put even a chain there, to not allow any other boats than Spanish boats crossing the strait and going there, all the coast up to Peru actually was a very rich country. So they sent 4,000 people in um, 23 boats, but only 330 they arrived uh, three years later, and three boats because of uh, weather conditions. They were very, very harsh. And they settled those two cities. Here, this one in the entrance of the strait, and this one um, more or less uh, 100 kilometers to the south. This is the actual location of Punta Arena, so just to show you where the city was located. The only thing we have now in that uh, specific place um, to the south, to this, this specific one, is this you know, memorial. You know, it's saying there that in the 25th of March, 1584, here was settled, this town was called um, Ciudad Rey Don Felipe, it's like the Philip II king, the city of this Philip II. You no. Know? So this is a very interesting failure um, happened to the most powerful empire, empire in the world in the 16th century. The two cities, they were not just abandoned, the people, they, they died. You know? So when in, that, in 1587 Cavendish arrived to the city, he, he wrote in the bitacora of the boat that he found only dead bodies there. And for that reason, he renamed the city as Famine Harbor. And it's still known like that, you know, like it's a famine, famine port, Famine Harbor, which is a tragic name, you know, telling you um, the difficulties the Europeans they have to settle there. They were not able to survive in a place where the Indians were populating for 11,000 years. So this basically, happen because the modes of subsistence, of subsistence and production of those Europeans, they were not able to be developed, further developed in this area. No, let's say uh, cows or specific crops, etc. And at the same time, they didn't consider not even the possibility to survive using the same sources the Indians they were using eating those animals I've shown you there. Like guanacos they were eating, they're very, very nutritive in terms of proteins, etc. But for Spanish people, that was completely inconceivable. They would not change their mode of subsistence. So that was the reason why these um, two settlements, they died. So they couldn't survive using local sources as the indigenous people, they did. And this is the only remaining there, so this is saying like here was Spain, you know, in, in a time, and then you have this little wall where this little wall is the only remaining of that settlement, you know, we, which uh, we, had, uh, we have nowadays. And um, what is interesting is um, about it, this, pi this picture is, is located more or less one kilometers away from that place, it's not connected with the settlement, but it's some way somehow um, telling you that, s in a way, if you see there are two features. One is a cypress, it's a typical European tree, survive, adapt, in a way, no? It's isolated, but he survived. It's, this tree has got more or less 80, 80 years, no, has been there. 
But look how it looks like because of the wind, no? But survive. But then you can see that the housing was here, was abandoned, and it disappeared, and it was completely blown off by the wind. So there you have, you know, an, a natural element adapted, even if it's foreign, you know, it's from Europe, and then you have the second foreign element, you know, as part of a settlement, it didn't remain there. It was completely blown off, you know. Then, um, in the middle of 19th century, the Chilean government sent another ex expedition to settle people there in the, in the strait, and in the year uh, 1843, in this place, very close to, very much close, I think it's like 15 kilometers away from this famine port, they settled this fort, again, to protect the, the maritime traffic from the Strait of Magellan. No? Um, the place, the settlement, it survived just because the governor, three years later, he realized that it could happen the same. They could not survive in that very harsh place. And he moved the settlement 100 kilometers to the north in this very high, very, uh, very uh, harsh gradient I explained to you. And then he, f he found the city of Punta Arena, which means Sandy Point, because of this, you know, um, cone you find uh, along the coast of the Strait of Magellan. No, now it's, it's, it's settled here, but it, it used to be just this sandy, very sandy, very strong sandy formation here. And then, after that, in 1876, they brought 300 uh, chips, no? and they started the farming exploitation, and since then, a very strong economic revolution took place in the city and in the region. And all this development was based on these animals, on this animal husbandry exploitation. Even nowadays, we have three million sheep. We have more, more those animals than people. We are 150,000 <laughs> inhabitants and over three million sheep there. No? And this is based, of course, on this, no? on the attributes of the ecosystem. This is a grassland, it's coiron, it's a specific vegetation there, no? which was used uh, for this economic activity to develop. And then uh, the process, it was uh, concentric in a, in a successive waves of expansion, as this map is showing. You have the two main cities here and all the other settlements for farmers. And then you see here how it was in 81, at 85, and 90. So you see here that in almost 30 years, the whole area of the steep ecosystem was occupied by the activity, and they found the only um, barrier, let's say, in the forest ecosystem here. No? And then you see how it grew very, very fast, the amount of uh, chips here. And also you see that there is a, a correlation between the percentage of growth of people and uh, the percentage of growth of sheep as well. So they're absolutely correlated. So as, as more sheep they were arriving, more people were arriving as well. And this is, of course, uh, based on the economic law of exploitation of natural resources where you use and exploit the... Um, most available and well-located resources first, and just when those are completely used, then you move to the next ring, and then the next one, as Fontinian already explained. So this is called economic feasibility of land use. No? And uh, this produced this concentric, expansive pattern, which was centered in the city, as a spatial progression. No? As you can see, very much clear here, no, that it was no, centered here, and then expanded you know, until all the ecosystem was completely used. You can see the reflection of that, as I said before already, in terms of population growth, no? but also in terms of the conflict between the boundary of those two ecosystems. No? The forest ecosystem and the steep ecosystem, as I said, they have very, very well-defined line. So in the pressure for expansion, the animal husbandry activity, they started with a deforestation process, and that is what you can see here in this area. It used to be a forest area, and then just those trees, they remain, 
they're some way somehow resilient, no, but they change. But the area was clear off to be exploited by the animal husbandry activity. The second important effect, it was that it, this um, economic boom of the animal husbandry, it transformed the city of Punta Arenas, a very small city lost in the southern part of the country, in one of the most important economic nodes of the country. So 10, 100 year, years ago, the city um, accumulated such a huge amount of wealth that it was able to develop a very sophisticated urban tissue, which it doesn't exist there in any other close by location, but just in the capitals. And you can see that um, very clearly when you look at the, um, at the specific features of this um, economic boom, which was based, of course, also and supported by uh, tra mar maritime traffic, as you can see here, and you see how it grew, you know, in terms of, of wealth, you know, how much you know, international trade was taking place, and this kind of buildings, you know, they were built by um, elite, uh, which was um, administrating all this wealth, all the flocks of, of money, you know, which went from the one ecosystem, from the steep, to the very city. So we have palaces in the city, in, in a location where you cannot find them up to 3,000 kilometers to the north. No? So it's, a, it's very contrasting, uh, again, to find that kind of architecture no? in this part of the, of the country. No? So we have um, many of them, no? expression of uh, bourguet architecture, um, they brought materials and uh, workers from Europe to build that typical expression of Belle, Ep Belle Epoque. No, it's like typical French uh, historical eclectic uh, style of architecture. And uh, of course, those they were, uh, uh, let's say, um, old pictures, but all those buildings, they still you know, remain in, in the very core of the city. But um, this was the golden age in, in 1910, and then after that, no, I, I'm just going to show you here one very important shock. No, there were there were others, but this is very clear, and this is one connected with the construction of the Panama Channel. No, in 13. So here you have the number of boats and the weight of boat, the freight. No, here, and then you see how it dramatically dropped. No, and it never, ever recovered, no? So that, of course, produced a, st a strong shock in the city, no? To adapt and to change. This was in 13. In 18, it was a change in the agreement of international trade between Chile and Argentina. In the same time, it was the Third World War, and then the maritime traffic also dropped. And then, uh, uh, finally, it was the crisis of the 30s, the economic crisis. No? And uh, what produced that, it was an intensification in the exploitation of the ecosystem, which finally ended up in, of course, in erosion. So here is the map of erosion. So you see that almost the whole ecosystem which was used by an animal husbandry is with some degree of anthropogenic erosion. You know? An important part is more, more or less 30% of it is a very high erosion process. Why? Because of the external shock is affecting the activity, the strategy of the activity is to increase the rates of exploitation. You know? As you see here in the graphs, you know? let's say you have here the amount of animals per hectare. This is an animal load and then you have here the rate of erosion. So you can see really clear that these are the communes, all the names are there, are here, and then you see the correlation between the degree of erosion and the animals per hectare. So it's absolutely depending on that. So as much animal per hectare you have, much more erosion in that specific area you're gonna find, no? And then you can do the same analysis with some other uh, um, indicators, like in that case, the 
in this case, the percentage of farming area and the animal load again, and then you see again that there is a correlation. While you might expect that this one, it should remain constant. The recommendation is one animal per hectare, and then you're going to find that there you have some, in some cases, 1.2, etc., etc. No, different, different uh, amounts. So after that, in th from 30s up to 50s, more or less. It was a completely the, um, shock, a stress in the city. Many people, they left. No? It was in a very, very complicated period of crisis until the discovery of oil, which was in uh, 1946. No? So then we discovered oil, petroleum. And then we started you know, an another um, um, phase of expansion of a different economic activity in this case. Now you have here the location of, uh, of extraction points of oil. No? Here you have the geological formation where you can find uh, oil resources. We uh, found um, a specific town, Cerro Sombrero, as a logistic support, uh, which is actually very funny. It's located in the very centroid. This is the geographical centroid of all the exploitation, and the city you can see was founded just just there, very very much by the by the centroid. You know? And this produced in the city a new wave of prosperity. You know? So you can see that again in buildings. In this case, I'm just showing you the process of of uh, pavimentation of the streets. You no. Know? Before they were done uh, with the stones, and then a complete renew of the pavement in the city, you know, again, direct effect of a specific economic activity. But as it happened before, you know, we are also um, facing these diminishing returns you know, because of the extortion of the sources started around 70. So here you have gas and petroleum. No, as you see that since 70s already is declining. No? So uh, this is declining, and it's the main uh, vortex of economic activity as it was before the animal husbandry. No? Then the changes in the economic matrix that started to happen, just to show you one example here with um, the uh, coal. So um, I have this graph uh, from the beginning, I mean, from the 1850s, no? And, uh, and if you see that, the rate of exploitation of coal was all the time around this level, no? Then here you have the rate of exploitation of gas, specifically. And then you see that here, more or less, around 80s, some change happened again, no? As the gas exploitation is dropping, suddenly the coal started to ga get more relevance, more importance. It's just an example, no? Because the transition, again, from this activity, you know, to other sources, it happened through the whole complete economic matrix, no? And then, after, um, we are still in, the, in this process of uh, exhaustion of uh, petroleum and gas, in the 80s, more or less, uh, we found the, this uh, the star product for some people. You know, they think it's a very much sustainable activity. I have very serious doubts about that, which is the tourism, which started more or less in the 80s. You know? So uh, here you have uh, the graph showing the arrival of tourists to the region and to the national park. Everything started in national park, which is here. and until nowadays, more or less, there are those four clusters, uh, very clear areas of uh, touristic exploitation based on a specific uh, geographic attributes again. Mm -hmm. And this is also very much accompanied by a specific opening of new roads. You can see here in those lines like this. No? These are new roads, you know, they were open or they are about to be open to allow the touristic exploitation you not know, to be much more efficient. And then uh, this is, as I said, of course, based on a specific sources, like this is Torres del Paine, is more or less here. 
But what is interesting to see in this map is when you see the correlation between the, uh, the nodes of attraction, the red ones, which were determined by the authority, the just the authority they just said this and this and that, and then you see the valuation with it of the uh, territory, the land. No? So you see the touristic value is very high in blue, and then it decreases you know, as it gets um, uh, yellow. And this, this assessment we did using the same matrix they did uh, after an interview of several tourists, they were asking, what, why are you coming to Patagonia? What kind of things do you want to see? And they were saying, mountains, fires, channels, like this and like that. And according to that valuation, no, we fill this map, and then you see that the two things they do not match. No. So the authority is saying on the one side that the location of touristic hotspots are there just because there is something, while the territory is saying that the value, touristic value, is somewhere else. So what you expect from this is that in a moment, and we are in that process, this red hotspot, they will move completely to the Pacific Ocean, which is a very much fragile area, ecological area, and is still unpop unpopulated. No? So the anticipation this map is showing is that we are about to use absolutely the whole area of the region, and it's a region which was cal qualified by the Wild Society as uh, one of the last of the wild in the world. Let's say one of the last areas without human intervention. But that is actually not true. Um, this has got a specific reflect in some specific uh, uh, social uh, dimensions, let's say. Here I'm just showing literacy. So you see here from 70s to 2000, so you see that it was uh, an increase. So as the society moved to the tourism, you need much more specialized people, and that has got a reflection in the amount of years of the labor force you have there. So now you have around 11 or 12, and before you have around four and six. So it's a complete switch. It happened now in 30, 40 years. In terms of labor force as well, you can see here you know, in division between primary, secondary, and tertiary sector in the settlements, so you see that only in a specific, uh, these are uh, mining settlements, they are not normal settlements, they are settlements that were set for oil exploitation. It remained the primary extraction as the most important in terms of labor force, but in all the others, let's say in Punta Arenas, in all the other cities, you see that the tertiary, the services, you know, is the much more important uh, economic activity nowadays, let's say. And this is uh, one of just one example of the kind of tourism is done in those, uh, as I said, very special, pristine, and fragile environments. No, these are domes in one of those islands in the fires. So towards the future, we are uh, now, as I'm saying, about to use all those areas which were um, not used until nowadays. So just some, some uh, very fast conclusions about this. Um, you can clearly see, looking at the economic activities and how they switch and change in the, in the land, four different eco-historical periods. You know, so where the modes of exploitation of land and the type of society and the environmental effects are completely interlinked. First, you have the indigenous eco-historical period until uh, middle of 19th century, then you have animal husbandry for more or less 50 years, specific effects, specific modes of exploitation, then we switch dramatically to petroleum exploitation, and nowadays again to tourism. The important thing is that all of those changes, they left a deep profound footprints, they are still there, and those are one of the important effects we have to take care when the system adapts to survive to the future um, with a specific a spatial but also a specific social structure, you know, which is allowing that change. And um, 
like the underlying trend is that there is a uh, systematic extension in the occupation in the pattern of exploitation of the territory, no? Up to use the complete extension of it. And you can see that just a sum up in terms of peopling, as you see here, the years and the amount of people and where those types of settlements they were found. So then you see clearly that the three steps, the Indian, of course, they do not have any settlement. Um, you see that some way, somehow, the region historically, since the beginning, had better literacy than the rest of the country. It was just after some profound changes in the educational system around 50s that the country really get much more better, but in our region, it, the literacy, it was since the beginning already much more better. Some way, somehow, you might say this background allowed those adaptation and those changes. Um, and as I said, you know, in terms of economic activities, you get, in terms of social way, this is a um, uh, labor force, you know, in from 30s to 2000, and then you clearly see the retreatment of animal husbandry and extractive, and moving more to services, you know, in this area, or also the presence of the state, you know, as pivotal also for the development. But also, a part of the research which really Im interests me a lot is uh, the traces of material extraction. Here you have all the sources we were extracting again from the big, uh, 19th century up to now. Now all of them you have, and then you see that there is a, a specific pattern you know, of, I, I call it asymptotic pattern. What that means, that if you see, for instance, as I mentioned in the beginning, with the chips, you see that increases a lot in the beginning, it reaches a plateau, and if it doesn't collide, let's say like the coal in this case, because you just deplete completely the source, no, it remains in a plateau. While the social structure has changed completely. So when you have here exploitation in animal husbandry, more or less 60% of the population worked in those activities. When you move here, no more than 3% of the population work in animal husbandry. But you see that in terms of material production, it remained in the plateau. No? So then you see that the system changed and adapt some way, somehow, but some other things, they have a very a strong inertia to remain. No? And then in the case, talking about the animal husbandry exploitation, I already showed you the erosion map. No? So there is the, a strong inertia to keep ongoing an activity which is producing an environmental effect and is not actually providing more benefit but just to a few people. And then you can do and go to a similar analysis to any of, of other those activities. No? I'm just going to skip that one. If somebody's interested in to see really how it fluxes from the one ecosystem to the other, <laughs> we can go and to discuss that. But just to show you this, that here again you have you know those very clear four socio-ecological periods. No? Then here you have the representation of the population growth, and then here the question is you know, whether towards the future you might have resilience or you might have collapse. And uh, Many times when I'm talking about collapse, uh, students or people, um, I mean colleagues, you know, they get like, oh, wow, collapse, what is that? And I'm going to tell you that collapse is just the retreatment to a lower level of complexity in a social system, and it is the most common factor of human civilization. It's not something exceptional. No, so you just have to have a look to archaeological textbooks, and then you will find that collapse is the most, and not succeed, is the most common factor. Yeah. So I have a bunch of um, uh, publications in Spanish, if somebody's interested, I would be happy to, to send that. And uh, there is also one article about talking about specifically the last of the wild and the amount of uh, human impact on those landscapes, and it was published in Regional Environmental Change uh, this year. There are also some nice maps and some indicate, special explicit indicators to measure the uh, 
really the amount of human impact. Okay, so um, the second example, I'm gonna try to go a, a little bit much more uh, faster with that. It is uh, talking about climate change and specifically looking at urban heat. So you know that urban heat island, it happened when the cities, they get warmer because of building environment, materials, they retain heat. They normally, they release that heat during the night and that produced this effect, which is called urban heat island. So you might expect normally plus two degrees at least in a city than in the similar surrounding you know, uh, rural environment. You know? And then also the second important thing is that we also know, this is uh, Oak from 870s already, that this temperature difference, it will change according to the specific urban tissue you might have. You might say, more the vegetation is going to be less, more built up, you're going to have more temperature, no? something like that. So to measure how a specific city it might be vulnerable to this uh, heat, if it gets you know, an excess in terms of heat, let's say in a heat wave, no? we develop this heat vulnerability, no? um, considering that the intensity and frequency of periods of extreme hot will increase, you know, according to climate change. Um, also, this is uh, not a relevant factor yet for planning, uh, specifically in my country, in Chile. And uh, as I said, urban environments are especially vulnerable to heat because of the physical conditions, materials retaining heat, but also because the people, they live there. No? So, so I, we have this uh, ob uh, in general objectives to analyze the vulnerability in terms of spatial distribution, proposing a specific index, and then uh, to explore the patterns in this spatial distribution, if there is a concentration of this <coughs> vulnerability or not. So we use the continuous urban area of Santiago de Chile. Here you have the Andean Mountains. This is the continuous urban area, the black line, and the yellow line are census uh, tracts. We use census tracts for the analysis, and we constrain the analysis just to the continuous urban area to avoid uh, distortion of radiometric indexes. Now, it might happen if you are including a large part of, let's say, ve vegetation, etc. cetera. No? Uh, we have 277 census tracts, and the spatial assessment focused, as I said, in 2010, just in that area. We have, um, based on literature, uh, EPCC, this summatory model, so where you decompose um, exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity you know, as separated, especially explicit indexes, then later to have the capacity to look at them carefully. Uh, definition, normally exposure is, refers to the nature and degree to which a system is exposed. No? So let's say it's much more the physical condition no, of vulnerability. Sensitivity normally refers more to the social construction of how what kind of people is more sensible to a specific known threat. And adaptive capacity normally refers to more the institutional dimension, how the system can really react, what kind of sources has to react to a specific known threat. Um, so for that reason, um, we use uh, a radiometric index, land surface temperature in this case for exposure. For sensitivity, we have a set of variables about features of population and households. And for adaptive capacity, we have um, uh, more living conditions and public institutions. No? So here's the list of, uh, of variables we use. No? As we use three times for exposure six variables for sensitivity and six for adaptive capacity. So here you have the description. Uh, so let's say, for instance, elderly population, because po older population is more sensible, they are more sensible to heat according to literature. So we use inhabitants per hectare above of 60 years old no, as a variable. Of course, we know that when you run a socioeconomic analysis, there is a high endogeneity, so you can see here that the correlation between variables is very, very much high. No? So that's why we decided to use a principal component analysis to avoid this collinearity. 
but also to reduce the complexity of variables. No? So some of them, they might behave in a similar way than others, so we use this te the statistical technique. So this is the, spa the spatial pattern of land surface temperature. You see in the mountains, it's, it's colder. Some parts in the centrum also, in the, in the periphery, connected to large uh, green areas. The airport is very, very heat. And then you see that there is a specific area here in the inner ring where the temperature seems to be higher than, than here, also in this, in this part here in the south. These are the com communes in the, in the city. And this is the distribution of uh, green areas there. So what you can see in some cases, as I said, some correlation between presence of green areas and dropping down of temperature. So we run the principal component analysis. And for the sensitivity, we have three main components. So let's say we have a cube. No? So it's a coordinate system with three. Uh, perpendicular, so they are not correlated. So you can do any mathematical manipulation with them. So for sensitivity, we have this cube. No, they fulfill the Kaiser rule, which is has to be they have to be no, normally more than one to be consistent, and they represent 71% of the variability of the database. In the case of adaptive capacity, we have we keep this one because it's very much close to one. So we have a plane. In this case, we have two components just, but we can really explain 92, almost 93% of the variability. So it's really, really a strong plane. This is the plot of the two um, analysis principles. So here you have uh, the variables. You can see here the, the volume, the, let's say the magnitude and the direction of the vectors. And then all those dots, they are the census tracts. So then you can see that there are census tracts which are where they have lower sensi sensitivity, they are less sensible, and then you have others that are higher sensitive, they are much more closer, they are really like tracked by those vectors. No? The same uh, case is for the adaptive capacity, just that those two vectors are minor, but they have also a different direction. No? Uh, by the center of the plot, you might find the census tracts with the average uh, behavior. Mm? So then we put those uh, values, the result of the principal component analysis, in the original map of census tracts, and then you have exposure, sensitivity, adaptive capacity, and vulnerability as the addition of those three explicit. No? And then you see that the exposure has got a specific pattern towards the west. Sensitivity is more like a cross, you can see, a cross of more sensible areas. And adaptive capacity is showing the typical cone of uh, location of high classes in the cities. All Latin American cities, they have what is so-called the cone, starting from the center, normally going to the north, in the case of Santiago de Chile, going to the west where the high class is located, no? So um, if somebody's interested in that, we can uh, talk about that then later. So then you can really clearly see here in, in, in the adaptive capacity that the stronger capacity is connected with this specific uh, distribution. And then here you have the summing up, which is a little bit more complex to interpret no? in, in spatial terms. And for that reason, we run this uh, cluster analysis. This is the Anselin e Moran for again for the exposure, sensitivity, adaptive capacity, and uh, vulnerability as, uh, as adding those three. You can much more clearly see here the cone I was talking about. In the west part, you have high, high concentration, so concentration, clusters of concentration of high values here, here, here and clusters of concentration of low values, no? here, here. No? And then here, and the, when you put them together, you can see four specific clusters of high vulnerability no? to heat in the city. So then we wanted to know why those areas, they were more vulnerable than others. So then we make the correlation with the original set of variables you have here. And what you find is very interestingly is that the higher weight is in no water supply. These are adaptive capacity variables and material index, no, which is 
talking about the quality of materials uh, where the housing um, possessed or this, it was built, and not the vegetation, which is here, the NDVI. No, the vegetation actually has got a very, very low weight in terms of explaining why um, those specific four clusters, they have high vulnerability. It's a very interesting result, challenging the normal understanding that you put vegetation to cool down the cities. Well, in this case, we are showing that actually you can put vegetation to cool down the city, and then actually the, the result in terms of vulnerability, it, would, it won't change too much. No? Um, these are the uh, factor loadings for the principal components. So here you see that the materials, they, ha they are the second component. They have very, very high load here. And then the third component is the no water supply. No, so they are perpendicular. They are not correlated to each other. And then you have that the others, they, they, they group in one other uh, component. So for that reason, then, we went into change, we wanted to measure how much I would get better the vulnerability if I would get better materials and no water supply in those uh, specific areas. And then you see here the changes you have. If you change it for the average for the, the, for the city or if you change it for the minimum value. Just to see, in this case, you know that they can really increase dramatically, you know, almost to get a non-vulnerable census tract if you increase those two variables. No? Here is done for the specific index, adaptive capacity, and here is done again for the uh, vulnerability index as a summatory of those three. So as I show, there is an asymmetric distribution of vulnerability in the city. The high temperatures are found in the north and in the western part, um, where they are less necessary, you have a stronger adaptive capacity, and uh, we found those four specific um, clusters of vulnerability. And as I said before, to reduce this uh, vulnerability, uh, we might need to take actions in terms of water supply and housing materials, and not in terms of provision of green areas, as normally we are thinking. So this, uh, it was published in PLUS One, so if somebody's interested, it's, a, it's more than 12,000 pages. It's a very extensive uh, research because, let's say, the statistical procedure was a little bit com complex. So you can uh, have a look at to the paper, or then we can later go on to discuss. Mm. Just to take a message home, I just brought two, uh, three very, very general ideas. So the first one is that regardless deep changes, sometimes, as I show in, with the example of Punta Arenas, there are underlying regularities, and we are, as we know that there are underlying regularities, we are trying to seek and to find the lasting fundamentals. You know, what can help you to really explain how a social system behaves? And that's why I brought this very interesting picture where you can see people here in the beginning of the 20th century waiting for the public transport and reading the newspaper and then you have here people you know in the beginning of the 21st century waiting for the public transport and also reading the news no so some way somehow everything changed but something there as a fundamental remained so that is the thing we have to really try to keep that core of the, the essence of the process. And then also, as I was saying before about the heat vulnerability, that green might, might help. Everybody's saying we were with Harold, Harold in China, and all Chinese are doing research on green areas to cool down cities, and then sometimes that it just not worked. So this is not, unfortunately, uh, an egg and some french fries. It's, uh, it's uh, some fruit with the uh, yogurt and some apples here. Mm. So sometimes the appearance of things, they can really, you know, challenge you. So you have to pay careful attention, you know, because the appearance of things is not all the time saying the truth. But mostly also that 
we need to have a paradigm to interpret the things. I mean, the reality, I like to say that normally, the complexity of reality is infinite. It's infinite, really. So as, as more, as you know, as more knowledge we will get ever, the complexity is gonna be much, much more larger than we expect. So for that, we need an interpretation, and the interpretation, no, in this case, could be cubist or surrealist of the exactly the same reality. It might be completely different. So we have to really take care of the paradigm. What is the paradigm you are using to get the interpretation of that reality you want to assess? No? And we had a nice conversation with Harold yesterday. In my case, I prefer to make that explicit and to know what is the paradigm I'm using for to understand this and that and to say it rather than to just ignore and to think that because I'm a scientist, I do not have a paradigm or ideology or a philosophy or an ethical position towards the things I'm analyzing. So that is the presentation. Thank you very much.